uh, join us in singing Man of Sorrows.
him a candy fly guy. There. That's not it. Oh my goodness, what in the world is going on? Oh, hi Carrie. Oh. I'm trying Gee. to find all my tools. I know I have a saw down here somewhere. Uh, oh, there it is. Oh, Jake, yeah. oh. Jake, what is going on? Good, Jake, what? Carrie, uh, you know, Carrie, what's going on? No, Jeez. I do Can you just stop long enough to tell me what's going on, Jake? Oh my goodness, do you guys know what he's doing? Uh, what? Why would he be throwing tools? Uh, what would he have to be doing with tools right now? Do you have any idea? No. Uh, <laughs> me uh, either. Jake, nobody knows what's going on. I need to find my tools so that the kids can use them at vacation Bible school. You know, VBS, vacation uh, uh, Bible school. Oh, but Jake, why, why would they need tools at Vacation Bible School? Well, it's called Fixer Upper. I don't think they want glue. I duct tape maybe, but I think tools. I don't know. Uh, I just think maybe they want some tools. Oh, uh, so why are you getting them together now? Why don't you just bring them when you come to Vacation oh. Bible School? Oh, that's the tragedy. A tra it's a tragedy. A tragedy. It's a tragedy. <sighs> this whole thing. My aunt, she's celebrating her 80th Ooh. birthday. Oh, that's that's a big yeah. birthday, Jake. Yeah, yeah. She's really old. <laughs> and I have to go. I have to go to that instead. It's just devastating, oh. Carrie. It's just devastating. Oh, that is <sighs> that is just devastating. But you know, it's really nice that you're that you're gonna share your tools with the kids. That's so nice. But what what do you th what do you think the kids are gonna do with all those tools? Well, it just sounds like so much fun, Carrie. It's called Fixer Upper. Something about a good foundation of God's word and fixing up or remodeling things. And I don't know. They're gonna be doing stuff. And I and 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 maybe they're gonna see how long it takes to make something look new again. Plus, there will be Bible verses, group time, snacks, Ooh. games, crafts, and so much fun. I wish I could go. I oh. wish I could go to it, Carrie. Huh. So, Jake, I wonder, Beans, you're not going to be there. Have you heard, are there going to, like, do they even have enough help? Well, you know... I really am a pretty big part of the help thing, and since I can't be there, Jermaine did say that she could use some more help, and I don't think more tools. I've got plenty of those. I think she needs people. Oh. I think she needs a lot of people. So if, if, if there's anybody that wants to help that can be there and don't have to go to an 80th birthday party, <laughs> then you could go hmm. help Jermaine. So do, when is this Vacation Bible School anyway? It's Tuesday. This, this Tuesday, Tuesday? Like yes. two days away Tuesday? Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Oh. In the evening, 6 o'clock, you know, which mm. is supper time. But they can eat supper there, Carrie. Oh, they can. They can eat supper there. Oh. Yeah. Their and moms don't be, even have to feed them early. It'll be good. It'll mm. be really, 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 really good. Okay, yeah. and what age can go? Well, you know, they said that pre-K, what's that, like four, five? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Up through sixth grade. So, there, and it's going to be like from six o'clock at night till eight. But if you want to eat supper, you should get there at 5 30 or else it might be all gone. If I was there, it might be all gone. Hmm. Well, it's really too bad, Jake, that you don't get to go this year. I know. Uh, but I know. you know what? I'm pretty sure that your aunt will be really happy to have yeah. you come. I'm sure she will, you know. She likes to squeeze my cheeks and give me kisses mm. and all that stuff. So I'll have to go and, and uh, you know, it'll be good to see her too. So it's all right. I guess I'll be all right. Mm. Well, the kids, they'll just have to, like, tell you all about it next, next time they see you. Beans, beans, you don't get to be there. That's right. I hope somebody takes a lot of pictures, and I want to see what they do for their crafts. And I hope nobody gets hurt and, like, smashing their finger with a hammer or anything. Oh, that would be bad, yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, I got to go, Carrie, but there's a video that they're going to show about this VBS, and, 
and then uh, all you kids can watch this video. Oh, okay. Well, all right. Well, we'll see you. Hopefully, you can use my tools. Bye. Did you guys tell Jake bye? Bye. Bye. Okay, I think there's a video for us to watch. Please stand and worship with us for the next couple songs. Yeah. 
I think about um, Jermaine's parents and parents of friends that I know who came to this country, the land of opportunity, searching for a better life, that sort of thing. And um, they arrived here not knowing the language, not knowing the system, not understanding things. I had friends when I was in a high school in college who would have to read legal um, letters, legal information that was sent to their parents because their parents didn't understand what it meant. And that's kind of the, the uh, experience of, I guess you would call them the one and a half generation or the second generation who comes over as immigrants uh, with their folks and the children know the language, they can speak English better, they begin to understand the system of how things work in, in the new country uh, where they are. And so I had uh, a friend whose parents would say, here, read this to me, tell me what this says. Because they, didn't, they, they couldn't quite grasp it. They didn't know and they were afraid because there's a little bit of apprehension when you don't know and here's the law telling you you need to, to do something. They don't know what it is. And so they didn't understand the language. They didn't know the system. They didn't know um, uh, uh, how, to, how to deal with uh, banks and would trust them because of maybe some things that happened in other places where they were. Uh, just that whole system was always a challenge there. And if you grew up in this country and, and you, we know the language and we're, our parents did as well, and so the culture is such that it's pretty easy to to fit in and to understand things, we take it for granted that there isn't some sort of um, challenge uh, in, in our society. And we don't know that or we don't appreciate that, I guess, as much until things happen to kind of turn things upside down, uh, where your health can be an issue, it can be a financial uh, big deal there, it can be some relational things that happen uh, in your family that kind of create this, this uh, disoriented, disorientation, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. And so you're kind of there, and you're not really sure how you're, how you're supposed to do, deal with things here. And so those are people, when you think about the challenge of, like I say, Jermaine's folks. My mom came over from the Philippines as well, but she, she knew English very well, and, and she learned that, and my grandmother was, had been to the United States before, before bringing my mom over here. And so uh, she kind of felt a little more comfortable, if you will. But just thinking about this experience that people have, and they voluntarily came here for the hope of a new life. So I, I give you that because um, we're going to start in the book of Daniel today, and we're going to... Uh, be going through this book in the next several weeks, and just thinking about how did Daniel and his companions and the rest of the exiles, how did they function, how did they get on with life when they were taken out of their country, out of their comfort zone, and brought into another land to learn a whole new way of life? And how do you keep your identity, if you will, in all of that. At the same time, make the adjustment to what you have to do in dealing with society. And you know, it's, it's not that different than who we are as Christians living in a society that is not friendly to Christian beliefs, if you will. That we have this challenge this, that Christ tells us to be in the world, but not to be of the world. And it's always a difficult balance. Because it's easy to get drawn away by the current of society and caught up into the things and to take on those values. And, and it's a challenge to stand for what's right. And sometimes you don't even know what it is. Okay. So uh, this morning, we're going to go through the book of Daniel. We're going to start in chapter 1 this morning. And the idea here is to remain faithful to God while we live like exiles in a foreign land. Right? Remain faithful to God while we live like exiles in a foreign land. And this is not a, uh, a new concept. I think we've mentioned it before. Uh, in the letter of 1 Peter, he talks about that a lot. And I think that's the mindset we need to have as we're um, living in our times now 
about how we're to, uh, you can't go back and say, okay, well, we were founded as a Christian nation, and we just need to get back to that, and, and that's all it will do. It will just take us right back to it, and everything will be okay. I, I don't think we're going there. I don't know how you feel about that, but I don't think we're going back to that. I think things are going to be different, and they're going to continue to be different. As much as you want to look back at what was, quote, unquote, the good old days uh, that none of us lived in, <laughs> right? Uh, but we lived in some good old days. And a lot of times, the good old days were not as good as, um, as we remember them. Anyone ever watch the um, Karate Kid stuff? Okay, and I know there's a new thing out called the Cobra Kai something, did you guys hear? So you guys remember the story here, okay? And so there's this bad group of people, and then there was this, there's this karate kid, and he was getting bullied and stuff like that, but he learned karate, and so therefore he was able to defend himself, became a great big hero, took on the bullies, and won, and it was great and fantastic, and everybody celebrated, okay? Well, so, so the thing is, they, they started, uh, I think it's, I don't know who it is, if it's like, one of these streaming services has a new series that they have out. I think it's called Cobra Kai or some Karate Kid Cobra Kai, something like that. And it tells the story from the bad guy's point of view. It's kind of interesting. I, I didn't watch it, but I read some reviews on it. It was kind of interesting. And it's humorous. It's supposed to be funny. But the idea is that you think this hero is all good and everything like that. But there was a time in there where he, he hit a guy who wasn't expecting it. And if he was a bad guy, you'd say, oh, he sucker punched him, right? But he's the good guy, so it's okay, you know? It's a different perspective, right? And so um, just, just trying to uh, say that the good old days, you know, you have, you know, as I think about past times and think about how good certain times were for me, like for high school for some of you, it was great. It was the best time of your life. Some other people, it's like, I hated high school. I was just so glad to be done with high school. Because the experience was so different there. And so uh, as, we're, as we're looking at, um, you know, our history and the good old days, you know, it depends on where you were sometimes if they were really that good. Well, if you were a slave in this country, were those days really that good? Right? I don't know, something to think about. Uh, but here it is. We're going to Daniel. And the idea is to remain faithful to God uh, as we live like exiles in a foreign land, in the land that we live in, even though we call it a Christian nation, the values are different now. You know, we have things that you could not say, hey, this is a Christian nation based on these values, based on what we have in our legal system there. Uh, I would challenge that just based on that. How do you define that? And so we are like exiles in a foreign land as Christians, no matter where we are, because as Christians, that's our first point of identification, right? We are in Christ. And so country is secondary, if you will, in that regard. Here it is, Daniel chapter 1. We'll get there, and hopefully you can read that. I think you can. And so I'm going to be reading out of the English Standard Version, and here we go. And some of us are, you know, really familiar with uh, the stories in the book of Daniel, and so this will be very familiar, so indulge me as I read every verse of chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, Youth without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. 
But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in a worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. And this is the word of the Lord. So as we look at this passage here, we're seeing that here is the idea. Daniel is hauled off, he and his uh, companions and some other people that we don't have everybody listed there, are hauled off. They're taken from uh, Jerusalem because a uh, new king has set up shop, if you will, there. Uh, a new kingdom has come in and taken over and put a, a, a new king there and um, taken Daniel and his uh, companions out. They were chosen by this king because of their intellect, because of their uh, appearance, uh, to be kind of head and shoulders or better than the rest, and brought over and taken into a new land to learn some, a new language and to learn uh, a new culture. And so um, as they're there, they have to face some challenges. They have uh, dietary uh, things that come in, and so they have to decide, what am I going to do with this? Their names are changed. The language is different. They're given uh, different kinds of food there. And they have to figure out, well, how do I keep who I am and at the same time uh, make this transition because I really don't have any, any control over it. And if they were familiar with the book of Jeremiah at that time, which could be very much, we know Daniel was as he got older, that the idea is that God had already proclaimed that this would happen and that they would be taken out, and they would be brought into a different land. And so uh, he, he told them to, that that would happen and that uh, there would be, um, God would be with them in all of that, even, even still. So how, is he, how are they going to trust God in all of this? So uh, the first point I'd like to make is, comes right with this. It's called God is in control still, Okay. God is in control still. Why? Because, because of the way that things are happening and unfolding in uh, Daniel and his companion's life, that it's hard to believe that God is still in control. But the way the words read in the scriptures right away, it lets us know that God is orchestrating all of this. God is the one who's dealing with it all and, and, and controlling it all. It's not happening uh, by accident. So it says here, to start off, it says, in the year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. So just to go back a little bit in Israel's history, we know that King Saul was the first king, and after King Saul came along, who uh, there was David, and David had a united kingdom, uh, and then Solomon did too. Solomon was the last king that had a united kingdom. And after Solomon came, uh, what happened is the people rebelled against his son, Rehoboam, and they sided with a guy named Jeroboam. And so the 10 tribes, the northern tribes, became known as Israel, and the southern tribes, two tribes, we called, uh, were called Judah. And so you have uh, the separation that takes place. 
And as it takes place through the history, you find out that uh, the kings are bad and the people are bad and some good things happen. And there's some good, good things that happen, but mostly it just keeps on spiraling down and down and down. So finally, God brings his prophets onto the scene and continues to tell these kings, look, if you keep on disobeying me, if you keep on following after idols and, and that sort of thing, that, that I'm going to take you out. I'm going to bring in an army that's going to overrun your country, and you're just going to get destroyed. And so it kept on happening, happening, happening. Finally, what seemed to be sudden was something that had been taking place for a long time that God had said this was what would happen if you kept on doing this. The people disobeyed him. And so the northern kingdom, the Syrians came in and destroyed it, okay? Took it out, and that's in uh, 722 B.C. And so uh, after that, you figured, okay, you still have this southern kingdom, and they're supposed to have learned from the northern kingdom. They're supposed to see the things that they did and not do those things because that's how it is, right? You bring somebody in usually to talk to people and say, look, at here's the mistakes that I did. Don't do these things. And the people who are listening to that say, uh-huh, uh-huh, and they walk out the door and go and do right, do exactly those same things. You ever seen that happen? It's kind of interesting how that works. What you would think would continue to, to uh, straighten out people, the warnings, to see the experiences, the history before them would cause them to change. It doesn't. A long time ago, there was a TV show, uh, a special that came as a documentary called Scared Straight. Any of you ever see it? Oh, okay, so you know, right? And so the, the, the premise behind it was here are these criminals, and they were trying to do this kind of intervention thing for these juvenile delinquents to keep them from becoming lifetime criminals. So they had these hardcore criminals who were in jail, and they would get into the faces of these young people and tell them, you don't want to do what I did. You don't want to be like this. I'm here, I'm locked up, I'm away from my family, all this sort of stuff. And it was to try to, get the, to deter these young people from falling into the same sorts of mistakes. And at the very end of the show, and they're nice to these young people because they, they tell them as hard as they can, but they're, they're doing it in a caring fashion still. And then at the end of the show, they show one of the youths that had been in this program now entering into jail, the jail where these guys were. And he's like, hey, guys. Like, it's a big, big buddy thing. And they just basically turn away and look away from him because it's not going to be the way it was when they were trying to teach him that because now he's too late for him. And so you think what would happen is that you just learn from that. And we're no different either. We think, oh, yeah, you know, I would learn from all the mistakes of the people before us. Just look at our country. You think we're learning from the mistakes of the people before us? No. And so this is what was happening with, with, with them. So Judah was supposed to learn this. And then God said, hey, if you guys don't learn from what happened before and you keep on going down this road, the same thing is going to happen to you. And sure enough, that's what happened. So um, what, what we have here is we have here, it says, in the third year of, of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, so he's the king there because uh, the Egyptians came in because, you know, there's a history, right, of the nation of Israel, how they would keep on leaning on somebody else. They would go to a different country to get help whenever somebody was, was threatening them instead of turning to God for their help. And in this case, it was the Egyptians. And so they had gone back and they would go to the Egyptians and say, help us, help us. These guys are coming at us from the north there and they're going to they're gonna hurt us. So please help us, you know. And so they would pay them money and kind of go underneath them. And that's not what God wanted for his people. He didn't want them to get underneath the, their, uh, their law, their empire, if you will. And so what happened is finally Babylon rises up there, and they come in, and they wipe out the Assyrians, and then they come in, and they take out the Egyptians as well, and they rule over um, they rule over Babylon. So in the third year of the reign of King Je of, of Jehoiakim, he's the king of Judah because the Egyptians had taken out his brother and replaced his brother with him. And so he's friendly to these Egyptians. He keeps on going back to them. Well, it turns out the Egyptians can't help Jehoiakim 
with the problem with the Babylonians. And so it happens the Babylonians come in here, and that's what we find out here. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, and he besieged it. And it says it's in his third year, and there's, um, in the book of Jeremiah, it says it's in his fourth year, and it's just a real easy way to reckon that. Sometimes people start their years at different times, and so you're not quite sure of when they're counting, and it depends on the writer's perspective here. And so if you count it from the way that the, the uh, Israelites or the Jews would render something, it would be the, the uh, fourth year of Jehoiakim, and in Daniel's point, he's coming from a Babylonian standpoint here. He says in the third year. So it's really easy to reconcile that, okay? Um, do you know that, uh, I don't know if you know different cultures, but the, the Chinese, what they do is when a child is born, they're a certain age already, yeah. Yeah, well, after three months, they go and have a big, big party, and it's like celebrating a child's first birthday there, you know? And so, so when, when Jermaine asks her parents, how old are you, you know, it's, she's really not sure, even though we kind of say this is how old they are, you know? They, 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 they know, but they, you know, it's like, well, we always counted it from this time, so depending on how they counted it. And, and, and their birthday would move around each year, based on the lunar calendar. So we had to just kind of declare it, it's on this day. So that's how Jermaine remembers her mother's birthday. It's Mother's Day. That's how they, they remember it every year, even if that wasn't her actual birthday. Kind of interesting how that works. But anyway, just saying here, so I have this rendering here. Jerusalem is besieged by Nebuchadnezzar there, and so he takes over there, and what he does is he he, he wants some people to come out of there, and we get this in a, a little bit later on. It says, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. So um, Daniel 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, makes it clear that God is the one who's caused this to happen. The Lord gave Jehoiakim king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. So that's why it's important for us to know that God is in control still because there are things that happen. As you read this, you're like, what's going on here? Why is God letting his people, this happen to his people there, that they're getting overrun, and now the, whole, uh, the holy city of Jerusalem is getting disbanded, basically, and a little bit later on, the temple gets destroyed. But this is all happening, but it's happening under the orchestration of God. It's part of his big plan for things, and that's what we find out a little bit later on as we go through this book of Daniel. You're going to see how Daniel kind of puts all prophecy, kind of puts all the Old Testament in more perspective there and kind of projects out into the, into the future. So the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And it says they go to the land of Shinar. And if you think about the land of Shinar, Shinar, there's a couple different places where it appears before. It appears in in Genesis chapter 10, and it talks about a guy named Nimrod. And he goes to the plains of Shinar. And and then also the Tower of Babel is is that same area there. And it's it's, it's, it's a bad place. It's a place that's always away from from uh, the ways of God. And so they take the vessels of God. These are things that were used in the temple worship, and they bring them in uh, to this land of Shinar, Babylon, to the house of his God, and he places those vessels in the treasury of his God. So it's just another thing to add into their little, uh, their little temples. And to think about this, you know, the, that Isaiah had... Um, had prophesied that this would take place in chapter 39, verses 6 and 7. And, and um, I'll go there real fast. I want to just kind of read that to you because it fills in some, something later on too, okay? And so it says this. I'm sorry I don't have it up on the screen for you. Um, but it says this. Uh, so starting in verse 5 of chapter 39, Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away and they shall be eunuchs in the, place, in the palace of the king of Babylon. So 
uh, it, Isaiah had, had prophesied this. Uh, this was for uh, Hezekiah because after Hezekiah was given some extra years of life, turns out he got a little bit prideful and some people came over from Babylon and he like showed them, look at what I got, look at what I got, look at all our gold, look at all this, look at all that. And so these guys are like, oh yeah, they're taking an inventory of what they were going to come in and steal when they came and overran this country. And because of that, uh, you see the pride there and it begins to, uh, the judgment begins to fall. And God said that some of uh, Hezekiah's um, line would even be taken in and become eunuchs there in a different land. So we know that Daniel comes from uh, the royal family, some or nobility anyway. And so there's, there's, uh, there's an understanding here that he's coming from the higher ups and, um, and Nebuchadnezzar takes these guys and brings them into his land and he wants to re-educate them and tra- teach them his ways. And uh, one of the reasons he might have done that was because in the future he plans to have the Jews and he needs help administrating and when he goes back into dealing with that land that he's taken them out of. It might be he just wanted trophies in his, in his palace all the time to look at his conquest and know these young boys are people that he had part of his conquest of, of Israel. So... It says here, the king commanded Ashpenaz, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the people um, and uh, the royal family and of the nobility, their youths, um, without blemish or good appearance, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of food uh, that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. And so he gave them some food. He had it set up for them that they would be eating this every day. And it turns out that we don't know exactly what that diet was, but we know that somehow or another it didn't sit well with, um, with Daniel. Somehow or another his personal conviction was that they couldn't do that. Maybe it was in the law that said, I can't eat this. We don't know what the food was, so we can't say. But it could have been pork. It could have been prepared the wrong way. It could have been... Uh, a number of things. We just don't know. But he felt convicted enough to say, hey, I don't want to eat this food, okay? And so as he's dealing with this, you find out that not only did they put them there and they were to be educated for three years, uh, verse 5 tells us, um, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king, but they were also given new names, and their names reflected the culture of their time, the pagan deities that they would... Um, that they would be involved in their worship with there. So Daniel, um, whenever you see the word L or the letters E-L at the end of a name, that has to do with God, okay? So Daniel's name is obviously means, well, you've known by now probably that God is my witness, right? And so uh, they were given some different names that reflected the pagan deities there. And so... Um, if you want, I can tell you about that later, or you can look it up in a commentary or something like that, and, and you can deal with that. But as it stands there, the idea is that even though Daniel is taken into a different land, he and his companions, even though they're going to be trained in different and educated in different ways, even though the food that's brought out to them is different, okay, God is still in control of, of, of life. Okay? So God is in control still. Secondly, uh, the idea here is that uh, somebody had told me before a long time ago that we need to stand for something or you'll fall for anything, okay? Stand for something or you fall for anything. And in Daniel's case, he decides uh, in verse 8, he says he resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food. So as this is going along, he's being taken along by this. He doesn't have much choice in where he's going, right? He's taken there, and then he has to make some decisions about what's going to happen with them. And so when we think about that as people who know the word of God and as people who call ourselves Christians, we look through our society and we say, there's certain things I just won't go through. I won't go into. I won't deal with that, you know? And when we were younger, you know, we had some convictions about things. You never went into a movie theater when you were young. I I didn't have that problem, but people before me did. And some of you had that experience as well, too. If you went into a movie house, it was a bad thing. You weren't supposed to do it. 
okay? Uh, so there's some, some, you couldn't listen to certain music on the radio that's like what we play in church now, right? And, and that was a big no-no. And there were all sorts of reasons that were put out there for it. And I, and I think there are some things that you connect with, with certain things and you say, uh, I, I think when we talk about culture, there are certain things that you would connect with things that you just say, I can't do that because I'm too close to that. So for instance, if rock and roll kind of be the beginning of the downfall of America, you know, for some people, you know, some people's mind, the Beatles came on there, Elvis, whatever it was. And some people really like that music, some people don't. And I'm not making a, I'm not making a, a judgment on you, okay? I'm just saying that there's some people who said, that's what happened. That's when, that's when our whole society got messed up there. Rock and roll music, you know, it began it all there. And, and like I said, the same stuff that we heard before, I mean, it's what we play in church and we say it's music, and we're not saying it's, it's bad, why is that? Well, people who associated the rock and roll music with a particular lifestyle or a, or, a, or a looseness about life, if you will, connected that. And so they said that it's the music and the lifestyle, it all goes together. But we're so far removed from that, it's not connected the same way anymore. So you can have that music and it's like, What's a, this, is, this is all right, this is cool. And there's no connection back to that at all. No. So... So things like that happen. In Daniel's case here, he's here, and he resolves not to defile himself with the king's food or, or with his wine. And it seems like his friends do the same thing. His companions are with him on it as well, um, because we find out later on that they're part of this testing as well. And so uh, he says, you know, I, I don't want to do this. He, he decides that he's not going to um, to be swept away by this, to just kind of give in to society, you know? And so we have convictions and we have a struggle with the things of our society. Some people won't go on the internet because it's all evil, you know? That's what they think, you know? Some people are on there and they're on there all the time and then the people who aren't on the internet look and say, you're on it all the time. It is evil, you know, because you're getting sucked into it. Some people... Wouldn't, wouldn't have smartphones because those are evil, you know? And, and, and there's different convictions in here, but those things inherently are not evil, okay? And Daniel's uh, uh, mindset here, he's dealing with this. He resolves himself not to defile himself or to pollute himself with the king's food. Maybe other people that were taken away there, other captives didn't have any problems with that. We know in the New Testament here, Paul talks about this, and he talks about food sacrificed to idols, and he says that we're free to eat, but he says if somebody's conscience is, is not free to do that, then they shouldn't do it. And if what you're going to do is causing your brother to stumble, then you shouldn't do it. But there's no law that says you can't do it. And in David's, uh, Daniel's case here, he resolves to do this, and he does it in, in a way uh, where he he, he checks with the, the chief eunuch to find out about it. And, and so it says that as he does this, he asks the chief eunuch, and he says, hey, you know, uh, uh, can I not eat this food? Because, you know, it's really not the type of stuff I'm used to. However, he put it to him, and he found favor with this guy. But it says here that he said no because he was afraid. Because even though he found favor with Daniel, or Daniel found favor with him, he was still afraid that his, you know, could happen. It says, it, says, it says literally his head, right? And so um, he says, I fear my Lord, the king, verse 10, who assigned your food and drink, whoop, sorry, who assigned your food and drink, uh, for why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youth who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. So there's a real threat there. So Daniel says to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel. So here's another person who's a subordinate there. And Daniel appeals to him. And he says, uh, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables. And so you know the story. He goes and he tests them and he give them a different diet. And as they give them a different diet, at the end of 10 days, they come before this guy and they look better and they look fatter and they look stronger than the people who were eating the king's food. And so... He's okay with it. He's not worried about it. And you know, sometimes it's like that with people. You can ask the official 
about something. Let's say it's about, I, 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 I don't know exactly what, what I'm doing, what I'm talking about and, you know, what example I want to give. But there'll be some things where you go to a government office and you can ask one person and they'll tell you something. And then you can go and ask another person and they'll tell you something different about the same thing. So we used to have a, a, a city county inspector come into our school in San Francisco, and one county inspector would come in and he'd say, you need to take this door out of this way because it's kids, it's a safety issue, all right. So we took the door out. Another inspector comes back to inspect us the next year, and he says, why isn't there a door here? There needs to be a door here. Well, he said, well, the last inspector told us that, that we didn't need the door. We, we needed to take the door out. Well, you should have a door in there. Then you have a door in there, and then the next inspector comes and says, well, you can have a door in there, and you should have a door in there, but it needs to have a window in it. And so each time, they give you something different. And so sometimes you have people like that, and they'll, one person, it's their head, and so they're responding a certain way. Here's another person who's got a little more leeway because maybe he's an underling, and his life isn't dependent on all of this. So this is the case here, the steward. And so he deals with it, and so uh, Daniel appeals to his authority, and, and taking that stand, God honors that, gives him favor with this guy, and so now they have a place where they can at least maintain their identity in this, and they can maintain their faithfulness to God as they are uh, in exile. And so it, does, the, it moves on a little bit, and it says, as for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. So once again, it's God's blessing on them. And so uh, the final point here is that God supplies us with what we need. God supplies us with what we need. God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. He gave them this because they sought to honor him. And so anyone who seeks to honor God, God will honor as well. And so he gave them uh, uh, this favor with these people. He caused them to be skillful. And it says, these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So all of them had skill in the literature and the wisdom there. So they were very learned. They were able to, to, to understand the laws and the culture and the language and such. But in Daniel's case, he has some special gifts. He's given gifts of understanding, visions, and dreams, which is going to be important because this book is not just about some kid who was in exile. It's about a prophet of God, and it shows how he is uniquely equipped to carry out that ministry where he is. And so this is, this is Daniel. He's given this, this special skill and says, at the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And, and, and as he spoke to them and he asked them questions there, they all were able to, to answer him. And it says that they were 10 times better or completely better than all the people, all the other uh, king's um, uh, advisors, if you will all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And it says, and Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. So we're giving a, a little bit of uh, background on this of what's going to be happening, how long Daniel's there, and how God uniquely gifted him, provided him with what he needed to be able to carry out this ministry. So um, going through this first chapter, I know it's a story that you know, and it's probably, uh, we could have done a lot of different things with it, but the idea is, I want, I want us to get us to understand here that God is still in control in, in all of this, that he provides what it is that we need to fulfill the ministry he gives us, that we need to stand for what is good, what is right, what is true. We need to take a stand for something, otherwise we will get swept away by our culture, that says, it's okay to do this, it's okay to do this, it's okay to do this, it's okay to do this. And there's an erosion that takes place from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. Have you heard of the saying that said, you know, the, the convictions of the previous generation become the preferences of the present generation, which become the irrelevancies of the next generation. You see how that works? It came from this is absolutely the way it has to be. That doesn't even matter anymore. And there's a drift that takes place. So we want to remain faithful to God as we live as exiles in a foreign land because that's where we are and that's who we are. 